Our next speaker is Sarah Morton, uh, who's the Objects Conservator, brackets Archaeology, from Oxford <laughs> County Council. Um, as Sarah said, uh, Objects Conservator brackets Archaeology. I'm now Objects Conservator and Business Unit Manager. We've just been restructured. Um, so things sort of changed a little bit, which does sort of tie into my talk. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to echo uh, what's just been said, uh, some of the issues that have been coming up around volunteers. Um, we are a county council service. Uh, I actually am based at the archive. Uh, that's where conservation services are based. Uh, we also have County Council Museum, we have partner museums, which are small regional museums, and then we also have a lot of links with uh, very small local museums, volunteer-run museums as well. Um, as part of working with volunteers, these are sort of all the things we already do with volunteers. We've done it for a long time. I think a lot of people will recognise this. Uh, object handling, packing, conservation, cleaning of displays, documentation, photography. Um, these are all sort of things we train volunteers and I don't think that's sort of much of a contention anymore. Um, most of the projects we have volunteers currently working on, uh, they tend to be on our collections, they're coming to the archive to work, as someone just said they're supervised by a member of staff, they have someone that they report to, they're working in conservation, uh, they'll have someone from conservation to report to uh, and these are two of my volunteers working on repacking objects in our metal store. Um, it's a preventive project, Things need repacking, it's improving the collections, improving the storage, um, and I supervise that. Um, when it's our collections, it's very straightforward. We can set guidelines, we write policies, we supervise the volunteers. Um, what I want to discuss is what you do when you have small volunteer-run trust museums, and they're not your collections, the <coughs> collections belong to the trust. So in some respects, they can do what they like with them. They don't belong to us. They can choose what they do with their collections. Some of the small museums that we work with uh, are, are accredited, so that will come in as, a, as an issue. They will have to sort of maintain their collections a certain standard for their accreditation. Others aren't. They might be working towards it or sort of not working towards accreditation at all. And the case today I wanted to look at was uh, Charbury Museum, which is a small village in the Cotswolds, it's a very nice place to visit, um, and this is just sort of the end of Charlbury Museum here. It's completely volunteer run, all the objects in it belong to Charlbury Museum Trust. Um, and there are no sort of professionals, museum <coughs> professionals working there, there are no museum professionals on that trust. They have very little knowledge of conservation, they have had some basic training in sort of conservation cleaning and they are interested in looking after their collections, but they have very limited funding. And previously, we have been able to support small museums like this as a county council service. We've been able to give more advice, give conservation <coughs> support and help. We've just had a 40% cut in budget. Um, we can't offer that for free anymore. We don't have the staff. We have to look after our own collections first. Um, so although this is about big society, it's also about funding cuts and budget. It does come back to that a lot. Um, the issue we've had recently, and this isn't a project we've started, it's something that we've been sort of discussing in the department, so it'll be interesting to get people's feedback on this. Uh, this was a, what the child we call their mini museum, and it's a little case of objects. At some point they've all been packed in these plastic bags, and we think the sort of green corrosion you can see uh, on some of them is due to a reaction with the, the plastic and what they're actually packed in. Uh, we're not entirely sure, we're hoping to get some testing done on that uh, through one of our sort of student connections. Um, but what they want to do is clean them up and repack them and re-display them. Uh, so once we sort of really know what we're looking at, we can quote them for that work and we can do it at the Museum Resource Centre. But we pretty much already know, due to their funding, they don't have the budget for us to do that work. Uh, so the debate that sort of came up that we've been discussing is should we train them to do that remedial work? And in the past, we have sort of set out our guidelines as being, we'll train volunteers, have them work at MRC, let them do preventive work. Should we be training them to do remedial work? Does this mean they're going to go back to Charlbury Museum thinking, well, I've had my conservation training, off they go doing what they want with objects? Um, so it was a real concern for a lot of people. 
the solution after sort of talking it through that we've come up with and what we, we, we think is the best solution to this particular problem is that we will use their funding, the limited funding they've got, to run training session. They'll pay us to run a training session and they can come and work at the Museum Resource Centre to actually clean these objects. Um, the reason we think this is the best approach to this is this will get the most out of our limited fun the limited funding that they've got. It will mean all those objects can be conserved and treated and repacked properly. By letting them come and work at the archive rather than just giving them half a day's training and sending them away again, it means we can retain some control over the conservation work being carried out. And as George said, you can't just give them a little bit of training and then expect them to follow your instructions. Uh, not everyone always understands the instructions. We're engaging more with the volunteers, establishing relationship with them. And because they'll be working with us on a more long-term basis, this means we can promote good conservation practice. And I think we're sort of talking about ethics today, and it came up in the last discussion, that it's not just about teaching someone to do the sort of nuts and bolts of conservation. There's the whole ethical debate that goes on around things. And I think if you can engage volunteers with that and explain why we make decisions, why they should be doing this, when they need to ask for help, and sort of, again, as it came up in George's talk, they will be able to make more decisions for themselves and know where to come for help and know when they can't do something. The other issue, and this comes back to funding and budget again, for a service like ours, which is County Council, um, we need to be relevant and accessible to these sort of groups. Uh, localism is on the agenda at the minute. Where our funding comes from is sort of under review. And if sort of local community, we're not supported by the local community, if they don't see conservation and our services as relevant, we will just lose more and more funding. So that's why it's so important that we're able to engage with these sort of volunteers and volunteer groups and sort of work with them in an ethical way and establish these relationships. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Kieran, would you care to respond? Um, my opinion of the big, uh, big society culture is it, it's a kind of a way of uh, I know, cushioning the blow of um, austerity measures and just job cuts everywhere. So saying, right, okay, you might be unemployed, but there is opportunities to get out there and actually get involved in society. And in a way, it's a good thing as well as the, the negative aspects. But um, I think that when you have so many um, volunteers and we rely so much on them now in uh, most of our institutions except especially the smaller volunteer run ones that if we don't have them then it's the same as I know walking past someone drowning and doing nothing and you're letting these collections go and ethically that's as as uh, bad as um, as you know effectively just saying right we have nothing to do with you so I think I agree fully that you know helping in these training days is the best method of reserving these collections mm -hmm. to the point where maybe someday when it gets better that there will be more chance of uh, helping mm -hmm. these collections out in a, in a more f you know, direct measure. But it also um, highlights the importance of conservation to these people and promotes you know, their own um, interest and their own zeal and their own culture, mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing. I think in terms of your funding as well, mm. um, we, we sort of make the point that it's for future generations, it's for people to come in and join museums. And if you're not engaging with those groups who want to do that and are trying to look after cultural heritage, it starts to yeah, makes our profession less relevant. Uh, and they are the voices that will support you when the funding cuts come and the budget <coughs> cuts come. They're the people that you can fall back on to really sort of be putting pressure on that, no, these services are very important and we need them. It's, they're sort of, that's where the funding comes from, especially when you're in something like a county council service or a national museum, or it's coming from government funding. Okay. Any responses from the floor to Sarah? Over here. Deborah Kane, Birmingham Museum Art Gallery. Uh, it's partly from Kieran and your discussion mm. just there. I would just ask, do all of these collections or some of these collections actually warrant the time and effort put into them? Have we got too many collections? I think that if, if it's a, a local volunteer group and they're actually sort of putting money into the training, they're not getting it for free, the small fun funding they've got for conservation, we're using in the best way we can so they get the most out of it. The collection is important to them 
and it's important to the village. So it's very difficult to make a value judgment on a collection. Um, so you might sort of look at Charbury Museum and say, well, it's not the Staffordshire Order, it's, it's not the, you know, the British Museum collection. Um, but it's important to them, it's important to that group of people. So really, who are we to say, this isn't important, it doesn't warrant the time. If they're interested in it, then that's the value of that collection and they want to preserve it. So I think if they're engaged with their cultural heritage as a profession, we need to sort of support that. Just devil's advocate here. <laughs> if you had enough funding for your own mm -hmm. um, institution, would you bother with them? Yes, we used to. We used to spend. We used to actually give people a lot more time for free, basically, and we we saw that as part of our remit of the county council and part of our funding. But we've basically been cut back so much we can't. So we're trying to find ways of still giving support to people without saying we just can't engage with you unless you can pay us. Well, yeah, but we're not sort of, it's that sort of, unless they can pay us for everything, we're not sort of going to give them any training or help them and support them. And we do have a sort of thing of advice is always free. They can come, we'll give them advice, and we will still do that as the county council. Okay. Any other volunteer experiences out there people want to reflect on? Any recently involved with museums that have become recently volunteer run, for instance? No. We have one. Do you? Okay. <laughs> yes, one of our well, um, one museum's gone out to trust, mm -hmm. which is we do have some museum professionals, and then we have a sort of volunteer. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the trust has been difficult because they don't understand collections. Um, they're sort of coming at it from a very certain point of view, and as conservators, we've had to work very, very hard to get them to understand their museum collections and know they can't you know, go cooking in the Victorian kitchen with the original bits mm -hmm. of the collection. No, they can't use the mangle for open days. Uh, so we're trying to support them to keep that museum going and open, but at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation. Okay, we've got one here. Anything from Bristol Museum? I was just going to say, why not? Sorry? Used, why not use the Victorian? Well, with the, with the, the mangle issue, we have actually said to them, if you want to use one, we do have another one in the collection which <coughs> we've actually sort of read as handling collection. The one that's there is museum collection. It comes back again to sort of values of objects and the decommissioning boats people were talking about earlier and the deconstruction. We do have things for handling, we do have things for use, and then we do have things we see as collection because it's the only example or it's an important Oxfordshire example. So it's getting them, it's quite a subtle difference. It seems very obvious when you're a museum professional, when you're not, they're like, well, why can we use that one and not that one? And it's having to have that conversation and make sure people sort of understand where you're coming from. Okay. George? <coughs> George Munger. Um, yeah, going back to the funding, mm. I have. I've just been, well, I've been involved in a, a project recently, um, and part of the reason they got the funding for the conservation of the work that I'm doing uh, was because they were happy to develop a volunteer group, a conservation volunteer group alongside it. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so part of my job is not only to do the, the active conservation, but to... Uh, develop and work with their volunteer group and mm -hmm. as I say it's part of the funding. Okay. Well we've, it's we've good for your business at least anyway. Me, yes, yeah, that's yes. fine. Uh, but from but we found you. more and more just to come back to that that um, to get collections care funding and especially at the sort of level we mm. operate um, the only sort of way to get it seems to be to tie things to volunteer community yeah. projects because of the big society remit. Sorry I was just a comment about um, using volunteers. Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? Who are oh Louise. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember correctly, um, and Robert might have a view on this as well, is that um, when we had a project um, in my previous job, um, we used six apprentices, um, and the unexpected benefit of that was the amount of publicity, TV, newspapers. I mean, I think we must have been in about 50 Scottish... I think there were about 50 Scottish articles no. all about the conservation of this particular piece just because we decided that it would be good to have six apprentices, and I don't think anybody could have anticipated the level of interest that that actually generated. Okay, thanks, Louise. We need to, we, no, we need to cut it off, I'm afraid. We need to go to the next speaker. Um, thank you very much. Sarah. Okay.